When I was 10 years old, I've seen a documentary on TV about a very energetic 95-year-old man. He was sharing his secret to live a long and healthy life. I was hooked. It felt like watching a TED talk, actually. Would you like to know his secret? Well, he very simply said that he was swimming in the lake in front of his house every single day. A lake reaching freezing cold temperature several months of the year. So I was really thrilled. I felt like I understood it all. I knew the secret to life and longevity. So I rushed upstairs to tell everything I've just learned to my older brother. And when I was done, he casually told me, without even looking at me, well, that's nonsense. It's rather the opposite, right? The guy has good genes, he's dedicated, and that's why he's able to swim in cold water. So basically, his point was that rather than cold water swimming being healthy, this person had good mental and physical health, allowing him to swim every day. And whether I was right or he was right, or whether we were both right at the same time, I was even more excited. Without noticing it, he opened a whole new world to me. Without knowing it, he introduced me to a key concept in statistics called reverse causality. And little did we know, 20 years later, I will focus my entire career, and actually even more than that, to studying those concepts, to statistics, to scientific research. Since then, I taught statistics to almost 10,000 students from Bachelor in Economics to in vivo lab directors, but well, I'm definitely not here to talk to you about my CV. I'm telling you this because my job puts me on the front line to witness that we are facing a severe crisis and it concerns us all. We live in a world where data are more used and available than ever. But this information is very often either misused or misunderstood. And I really see this as the threat of illiteracy, making people subject to manipulations. So if statistics are broadly misunderstood, but we need them more than ever, we have to act. We need to include in our modern first aid kit basic knowledge of statistics to help us navigate in our world more safely and avoid manipulations. So right now, together, we are going to acquire this kit. We are going to speak a language that we all understand without any math. You will be able to carry this kit, but also share it with others. You will be armed in front of numbers. The kit will be composed by three key questions. Three questions that you'll always be able to ask to challenge the interpretation of numbers exactly as a scientific researcher will do. But first, let me give you the key. The key to think about it, a key that you can use as a reference point. So, here is the key. And it starts with a small story. Let's say you have a headache and you're not sure if you should take a pill or not. So you wait a bit, it gets worse. So finally, you decide to take the pill. And after a while, your headache is gone. But then you start questioning. Was it really the pill? Was it because you drank tea or plenty of fluid? Or was it just because time went by? Well, with the information at hand, it's absolutely impossible to answer this question. The only way to perfectly answer this question will be to have two parallel worlds. In one of the two worlds, you take the pill, and in the other, you don't. Or you take a placebo. 
And only in this ideal situation, if there is a difference, it would be most certainly caused by the pill. Because everything else from point zero to the headache will be exactly the same. But we don't have parallel worlds. And actually, it gets even more complicated. Because usually we are not interested in one individual, but in a bigger group of individuals, the population of Switzerland, of the US world population. In statistics, we are trying to get as close as possible to this ideal parallel world situation. And noticing the difference between this ideal situation and a real world situation will help you to put the finger on what might be problematic with the interpretation of numbers. Again, exactly as a scientific researcher will do. The absence of parallel worlds implies that the people between the two groups, with or without the pill, might have other differences. Maybe some drink more water, maybe some took a nap, or some are older than others. And if there is a systematic difference, for example, those who took the pill also drink more water, it might be impossible to know if they got better because they took the pill or because they took drink water. The two effects will be confounded. The main implication of that is that it questions the causality of the effect. So we all know that when two things move together, it doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other, right? Just what we call a correlation. For example, during summer, more people are using sunscreen and more people are drowning. That doesn't mean that one causes the other. It's rather that something else explain this relationship. Here, summer. And this is actually your first tool. You can always ask if there is something else affecting the relationship observed. And to illustrate that, let me use this magnificent animal. Research has shown that the pattern on zebras prevents biting fly attacks. So a team of researchers in 2019 actually tried to paint cows to see if it could work for them. And it worked. They were less subject to biting fly attacks. But again, what if, what if something else explained these results? What if it's not the pattern, but the paint itself, maybe the smell or the texture? That would be very problematic, right? So to avoid this issue, the researchers used three groups of cows. One without paint, one with black paint, and one with white stripes. Basically, they replicated what happens with parallel worlds, having just one thing changing at the time. And by doing so, they were able to pin down the effect of the paint itself and the effect of the pattern, and they could confirm their initial hypothesis. But in many situations, we are not doing scientific research, and it's very hard to control the environment, as in this example. And actually, those tools are often even useful in your personal life. The other day, a friend of mine came home, and she told me that her father, who is in a home, was really agitated, anxious, and it was quite worrying. She also told me that the doctor told her that it was caused by bad quality of sleep. So he was going to treat that. But what if? What if it's something else? What if something else is making him anxious and due to this anxiety, he struggled to sleep? That will be a completely different story, but also a completely different treatment. So that was your first tool can always ask if something else affects the relationship observed. But sometimes, the issue comes even within the two things we are observing, which leads to your second tool. Could it be the reverse? Back to the example with my brother. This 95-year-old man, very energetic, was he able to swim in cold water because he was healthy or was he healthy because he was swimming in cold water? 
right? Well, in this situation, it's most certainly both at the same time, mutually reinforcing each other. But when it's the case, it's very hard to know what's the driver or to what extent each of those is important to pr predict or influence the other. And this is something that happens very often. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic, some people argued that the lockdowns were counterproductive, not inefficient, counterproductive. And they did that using numbers. They showed that the countries where the infection rate was the highest were the one with the more severe lockdown measures. But of course, it was all driven by the opposite relationship, that reverse causality. Because the situation was out of control, the government will implement very strict lockdown measures. It's exactly the same as saying we have to stop firefighters. Those people are very dangerous. Every time there is a fire, we see them nearby. Well, it's exactly the same thing. And let me reassure you for this story of the lockdowns. In one of my latest papers, we were able to address this issue of reverse causality and show that indeed the lockdown saved millions of lives during the first year of the pandemic. Now, let's turn already to your third tool. It's worth it to understand that statistics is usually done in a very specific context. For example, often we don't have the time to observe the whole population of a country. So rather than that, we usually take a sample, a small group of individuals who will hopefully represent well the bigger group. But if this group is not a good representation of the bigger group, already many things could go wrong. Let's say I would like to know if, if finally I have the perfect British accent, because as you can tell, I trained that very hard for many years. But I don't have the time to ask the whole UK population, right? So instead of doing that, I'll, I'll ask my mother. And if she says yes, should I think or conclude that everybody will think so? Well, I'll let you judge. But actually, it goes way beyond this example. Politicians, some politicians, some news reporters really love to extrapolate. So they take an example of something that happens in the US to say something about Europe or the reverse or something that happens in the 80s to say something about today. And it's always a valid thing to do to question how those differences might affect the results. Can we really do that in this situation? And the best example I know, maybe the worst actually, is the following. In clinical research, so research on drugs mostly, there have been historically a massive underrepresentation of women as subject of research. And there was two reasons for that. The first is that researchers wanted to protect mother and their babies by res reducing the amount of research made on them. The second is that menstrual cycles might complicate slightly the analysis. But if we do research only on men, can we really always conclude that it's the same for women? Well, certainly not, right? And actually, at the end of the 80s, in the US, eight out of 10 drugs withdrawn from the market have been withdrawn due to side effects observed only for women or mostly on women. So definitely an issue that might have severe consequences. So now, you own this kit. Next time you hear statistics, think about the parallel world story and use your three key questions to challenge the interpretation of numbers. And you'll see how quickly those tools can become part of your daily life. And the best way to illustrate that, or the best person to illustrate that is, is my wife. My wife is a social worker. She's working with moms and babies, and she's definitely not a big fan of math. But to this day, she's one of the person asking me the toughest question on those topics on statistics. 
And every time she does that, I'm reminded why I ask her hand. But way more importantly, every week or every month, she comes to me with concrete examples where those tools have been useful in her personal or professional life. So now, now it's your turn. Now you are equipped with this new first aid kit. But actually even more, now you are a Samaritan, able to share this knowledge even further. So next time you hear statistics, try. Try on the way home with your partner or friends, or next time you listen or read the news, or even during the next TED Talk. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. Take it as a game, a game able to enrich discussions, a game able to empower people against numbers and doubtful causal claims. <laughs>